Quanto tempo ia gostar de ti? Eu não tinha mais tarde.
Welcome to everyone joining, here, joining us here this afternoon at Boulevard Baptist Church at our 27th Emancipation Lecture and Cultural Presentation. I now invite us to stand as we have the responsive call to worship. The Lord our God is great. Response. The Lord is worthy of all praise. Come, let us remember the great things God has done. We will not forget our past and those who have gone before us. Let us lift our voices in song, our arms in praise, and our hearts in thanksgiving. Let us greet the emancipator God with a hymn of praise. We will remain standing as we lift our voices in praise with our opening hymn, When I Look at the Heavens. When I look at the heavens, the moon and stars, I shout your name, I praise your name, O oh God. When I look at the oceans, the beasts of the seas, I shout your name, I praise your name, O oh Lord my God, you made humanity a little less than your divinity. Oh Lord my God, we marvel you are great. You crowned us with your glory and your love. When I look at the flowers, the rain and streams, I shout your name, I praise your name, oh God. When I look at the sunshine, I see your light. I shout your name, I praise your name, oh Lord my God, you made humanity a little less than your divinity. Oh Lord my God, we marvel you are great. You crowned us with your glory and your love. When I look at the fields and the bird and trees, I shout your name, I praise your name, O oh God. When I look at the mountain, the sky and sea, I shout your name, I praise your name, O oh Lord my God, you made humanity a little less than your divinity. Oh Lord my God, we marvel you are great. You crowned us with your glory and your love. You crowned us with your glory and your love. Amen. We'll now have the prayer of adoration and thanksgiving by Reverend Delroy Harris and our response will be the Lord's Prayer in the traditional folk form. Reverend Harris, you may be seated. Let us look to God in prayer. Living and loving God, you are eternal and unchangeable, glorious in holiness, full of love and compassion, abundant in grace and truth. Neither oppression nor captivity can restrain the power of your liberating presence. Neither chain nor whip can undo the power of your healing love. We thank you for the nations of the Caribbean, our peoples, our rich and colorful history, the things that make us unique and the things that keep us united. 
We thank you for the mothers and, and the fathers of our history, who in giving of themselves have afforded us the liberties we now enjoy. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, we praise you that you are our God who sees our distress in this global pandemic. You hear our cries for help. You are concerned about the things that hurt us and are always ready to see to our deliverance. We thank you for Christ Jesus, our Redeemer, who came to heal our brokenness, and the blessed Holy Spirit, who continues heaven's work of healing, justice, righteousness, peace, freedom, and life through us. As we assemble to consider matters pertaining to the wellness of life and the land, inspire our minds and energize our bodies that having reflected together we may rise to continue your good work since we can do nothing well without you be with us this afternoon and grant that all that we say and do will allow your your reign to be experienced on earth through jesus christ our lord amen Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth, thy will be done on earth, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread. Hallowed be thy name. Forgive us when we sin as we forgive others. Hallowed be thy name. Oh, lead us not into temptation. Hallowed be thy name. Deliver us, O oh Lord, from every evil. Hallowed be thy name. For thine the kingdom, the power, the glory. Hallowed be thy name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallowed be thy name. Good afternoon, good night, good morning. Welcome to all who have made it here today to be a part of the 27th annual Church's Emancipation Lecture hosted this year by the Boulevard Baptist Church in Jamaica. To those joining us via YouTube, both here and abroad, welcome. I extend a special welcome to our guest speaker, distinguished epide epidemiologist, and a former chief medical officer in Jamaica, Ministry of Health, Professor J. Peter Figaro, who we look forward to hearing from later. In a time of crisis, the Lord spoke to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 42 saying, I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. 
It is in line with this mission given to Isaiah to set the captives free that the church's emancipation lecture was born. And the committee has, by God's grace, each year planned these lectures. As I mentioned, we are now at our 27th annual lecture, providing our people with the tools to enable us not only to recognize the historical wrongs or even rights, but to equip us with ways to free us from the chains resulting from the pains of slavery that have bound our minds and immobilized us, preventing us as a people from reaching our full potential. It is by the redemptive power of forgiveness and thanksgiving that we will achieve positive results. The planning committee, consisting of volunteers from the following churches, Hope United, Meadowbrook United, Webster Memorial United, Bethel Baptist, Boulevard Baptist, and the United Theological College, has worked hard to ensure that in spite of the COVID-19 challenges, the lecture would go on. The annual church's emancipation lectures are delivered at rotating church venues on socially and spiritually relevant topics, reflecting the original theme, emancipation, the lesson, and the legacy. As our press release stated, this year, these issues are made even more acute by the continuing and widespread public outcry against racism enslavement, and prevailing symbols of racial oppression and colonial domination. Today, we consider matters that have affected us from a medical perspective under the heading Emancipation, Resisting Diseases, Promoting Health Care. By applying the tools God has given us, there is no doubt that as a people and from a physical and mental perspective, we will say, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Now, as we get into the program, I will only ask that those of us here observe the protocols employed to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Lean back, learn from, and enjoy this afternoon's proceedings. Thank you. I invite us to stand again as we sing by the rivers of Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yeah, we wept when we remembered Zion by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down. Required from us. How oh, shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land by the rivers of Babylon where we sat down? There Remembered Zion 
Before the wicked carried us away, captivity required from us a song. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And the wicked carried us away, captivity required from us a song. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. So let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You may be seated. Our scripture reading comes from Exodus 13, verses 3 to 10. I now invite Kashif Barton from Meadowbrook United Church to bring the word up to bring the scripture reading after which we'll have a liturgical dance from Boulevard Baptist 95th St. Andrew Girl Guides. Exodus 13, 3 to 10. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month of Abib, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt shew thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came forth out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law might be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. Here endeth a reading of a portion of God's holy word.
We are truly being entertained in all forms this afternoon. All right, I now invite Dr. Panze Hamilton from the Webster Memorial Church, United Church, to introduce our speaker. And right after the introduction, as Sister Madden say, said earlier, we're going to lean back and learn from Professor J. Peter Figaro. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Literatist. Members of the clergy, members of the Emancipation Committee and the participating churches, our live stream audience, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasant task to, on behalf of the Church's Emancipation Committee, to introduce our presenter, Professor J. Peter Figaro, whose work and contribution in the field of health nationally, regionally, and internationally are outstanding. Professor Figaro is Professor of Public Health, Epidemiology, and HIV AIDS at the University of the West Indies. He has a distinctive record of public service in the Ministry of Health as a public health practitioner for over 40 years in various capacities, including national epidemiologist, leader of Jamaica's national HIV program from its outset in 1986 to 2008, principal investigator of the vaccine trials in Jamaica, and chief medical officer. For 18 years, as scientific secretary of the Caribbean Health Research Council, he vigorously promoted health research throughout the Caribbean. It is with much interest and pride that we note that he is engaged in very important work internationally as chair of the PAHO Technical Advisory Group on Vaccine Preventable Diseases and as a member of the WHO SAGE Working Group on COVID-19 and Vaccines, the UN AIDS Expert Scientific Panel, and the International Task Force for Disease Eradication. His stellar work has been recognized both nationally and internationally with several awards, including Order of Jamaica in 2008, the Pan-Caribbean AIDS Partnership Pan-CAP Award for Excellence in 2010, and the World Health Organization for Leadership in Global Health in 2019. A prolific researcher, Professor Figaro has 155 peer-reviewed publications and three books. His extensive expertise and experience in the areas of epidemiology, communicable disease control, HIV and sexually transmitted infections, vaccine preventable disease and research makes him the perfect fit to deliver this year's lecture in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have Professor Figaro as our 2020 presenter to address us on a current global issue and concern entitled Resisting Diseases, Promoting Healthcare. Professor J. Peter Figaro, we welcome you and we anticipate a riveting discourse this afternoon. Thank you. Hello, uh, there we go. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And this afternoon, I'd like to begin first by saying how honored I am to be invited to give this presentation and to pay tribute 
to two great pastors, Reverend Oliver Daly and Reverend Virgil Taylor, who I understand were important in initiating this very significant commemoration of emancipation. The theme that I would like to explore with you is that of the social determinants of health. Health is determined by the social conditions of life. These are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And these conditions, in turn, are determined by the structural determinants. This is the money, power, and resources at global, national, and local level. So this is a theme that I want you to bear in mind as I look at disease and health in the context of slavery and its legacy. I'm going to try and put this in historical context, look at the factors contributing to emancipation, and then look at diseases in Jamaica since slavery. So I'm gonna start in the Middle Ages. At that time, nearly everybody in Europe saw that all authority was from God. And the Catholic Church was the main religion in Europe. So the two authority figures were on one hand the Pope to do with religion and the king or the monarch to do with everyday life. Disease was seen as a punishment for sin, the work or possession of the devil, or witchcraft. In those days, in the Middle Ages, leprosy was a huge problem. And throughout Europe, there were thousands of leper hospitals because people with leprosy were excluded from society. They were outcasts, and there was tremendous stigma associated with leprosy. And then there was the Black Death. In the 14th century, 50% of Europe's population died within four years, 200 million persons. And over three centuries, there were 40 outbreaks of plague in Europe. Coming to the Great Plague of London in 1665 and the Great Fire of London. Now, around the time of 1495, there was an epidemic of syphilis that swept through Europe. And this was associated with the return of Columbus from the New World. So the predominant theory was that syphilis came back from the New World and swept through Europe. At the same time, the Europeans brought smallpox and other plagues into the Americas and within 50 years, nearly 90% of the indigenous inhabitants of America were exterminated. And this contributed to the downfall of the Aztec and Incas empires. So this was the time following Columbus coming to the New World. There was a search for labor with the indigenous natives dying out from disease and work. They tried to bring in poor whites, Irish, indebted persons, prisoners, they even kidnapped children off the streets and transported them to the Caribbean. And then the slave trade was introduced from Africa in the 16th century and racism was used to justify slavery and perpetuate it. Now, during that period, there were important changes in Europe. In 1521, Martin Luther initiated the Protestant Reformation, questioning the supremacy of the Pope. And there was the development of science. In those days, everyone felt that because the Earth was the center of the universe, the sun must go around the Earth. So when Copernicus and Galileo said the earth goes around the sun, Galileo was forced by the Catholic Inquisition to recant. But then the philosophers began to question, to doubt, 
how do we really know? We have to think about it, and Locke, an English philosopher, said that understanding is based on education, not innate ideas. And then, of course, the Industrial Revolution in England. So Marx describes the genesis of the industrial capitalist was built on slavery and exploitation. He points out the discovery of gold and silver in America, the enslavement in the minds of the aboriginal population, the beginning of the conquest and looting of the East Indies, the turning of Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins, signaled the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production. It was a century later that Eric Williams, the pri first prime minister of Trinidad, who has, as a student at Oxford University from 1932, he did his thesis on the Negro slavery and the slave trade, providing the capital which financed the industrial revolution in England. So during this period, Africans were being extracted through the slave trade and brought to the Caribbean and the Americas. Perhaps 12 to 15 million Africans, and slavery was responsible for 4 million of these deaths. But in the Middle Passage, perhaps 2 million deaths due to disease and starvation, dysentery, scurvy, outbreaks of smallpox, syphilis, measles, and other diseases. However, some of the slaves resisted slavery by refusing to eat and jumping overboard, preferring death to enslavement. And then records at Worthy Park Estate in Jamaica showed that at the end of the 18th century, only one out of five births survived infancy. A fifth were stillbirths, and a half died, most of them from tetanus, neonatal tetanus. So, as Professor Douglas Hall described in his book, In Miserable Slavery, the conditions for slaves were terrible. And for those of you who have not read this book, I encourage you to do so, although many of my friends have started and been unable to finish it because of how vivid the descriptions are about the terrible situation the slaves were in. Now in those days, slaves may have lived to 21, 22 years. And it's interesting to see that within England itself, a laborer only lived to 16 years. Why? A laborer started from childhood, from you could walk, you became a laborer if you were poor, and you died on average at 16 years. A tradesman might live to 22. It was only the gentry who managed to get into the 30s. So this brings us to the age of enlightenment in the sense that the European intellectual movement that emphasized reason, individual liberty and tolerance over tradition and religion was beginning to undermine the authority of the monarchy and the Catholic Church. And of course, the conditions of the working people were terrible. And this gave rise to the overthrow of the old order and the declaration of freedom and rights of man. So in 1776, there was the American Revolution of Independence against the British, followed almost immediately by the French Revolution calling for equality, fraternity, and solidarity. And then the earth-shattering Haitian Revolution in which C.L.R. James described the black Jacobins rising up and seizing their freedom. He called his book The Black Jacobins because the French revolutionaries were Jacobins and here you had the black Jacobins in the Caribbean. Around that period, there were an average of two major rebellions every year in the Caribbean. Now it's interesting to reflect and really reflect in 1776, the American Declaration of Independence 
had this to say. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Who could disagree with this? But when you look at it, they were not talking about Native Americans or black slaves in America, not even about white women. They were talking about white men. Of the first 12 US presidents, 10 of them owned slaves. George Washington, 317 slaves. Thomas Jefferson, over 600 slaves. So what do we learn from this? You cannot only listen to what is said. No matter how high sounding, you must always search for the truth and the fullness of the truth. The French revolutionaries in 1789, they declared the rights of man. They abolished the rights of the ancient regime. They beheaded the monarchy. And they proclaimed freedom and equality of the individual. Now what is interesting is that it was perhaps France was the first country in Europe to actually try and initiate public health measures in favor of the working people. They set up local health offices, officers and national health, a national system of social assistance. So they were trying to meet some of the needs of the working people of the time. Because historical, historically, for most of the history of the West, the efforts to combat epidemic disease had not reflected any sense of obligation to the health of the individual. What was at stake was the military, commercial, and cultural welfare of the state, and often the protection of the elites. However, with the Industrial Revolution and the movement of the peasants into the town to work in the factories, the wealthy could not escape contact with the poor and the spread of contagious disease in these cities was not selective. So increasingly, it dawned on the rich that they could not ignore the plight of the poor. And this brings us to the emancipation in 1834, 1st of August. However, before that, the Haitian slaves had seized the initiative and achieved freedom through the Haitian Revolution. And soon after, in 1794, the French revolutionaries abolished slavery. But when Napoleon defeated the French Revolution in 1802, he restored slavery. And it wasn't until 1848 that France re-abolished slavery. Now, following the Civil War, in 1865, the United States abolished slavery. But the southern states rejected abolition. And it is interesting to note that it was not until 1995 that Mississippi took slavery off their legal books. 1995 was yesterday. The abolitionists played an important role in advocating against slavery. The British abolitionists and those in the Caribbean and Jamaica. And they were led by the Baptist missionaries and the local Baptist preachers like Sam Sharp. We come back to Eric Williams, his book on capitalism and slavery. He showed not only did slavery and the slave trade provide the capital which financed the industrial revolution, but also that mature industrial capitalism helped to destroy the slave system. He said that these economic changes were gradual, imperceptible, but they had an irresistible cumulative effect. Men pursuing their interests are really aware of the ultimate results of their activity. So the commercial capitalism of the 18th century developed the wealth of Europe by means of slavery and monopoly. And in so doing, it helped to create the industrial capitalism of the 19th century, which turned around and destroyed the power of commercial capitalism, slavery, and all its works. 
So there were the economic conditions and there were the abolitionists. And Williams said, without a grasp of these economic changes, the history of the period is meaningless. And of course, there were the Haitian Revolution, and that was critical. And Toussaint Louverture was the leader of that revolution. He defeated the local whites, the Spanish, the French, the British. He went to make peace with the French, was kidnapped by them and taken to Europe. And one of his generals, Dessalines, became the first president of Haiti. The third component responsible for abolition, as shown in the Haitian Revolution, were the slaves themselves. And throughout the Caribbean, from the onset of slavery, there was rebellion after rebellion. And of course, the Jamaican, Sam Sharp, in 1831, the largest rebellion in Jama slave uprising in Jamaica, helped to bring the end to slavery in the British Empire. And these are some powerful emancipation monuments from Curaçao, Haiti, Jamaica, and Barbados. Some people wonder why Haiti is poor. But Haiti had to pay restitution of 150 million gold francs, equivalent to billions today, in order to get France to recognize them. They then owned huge debts to the US banks. And in 1914, the Marines entered Port-au-Prince, went into the National Reserve, carried out all the gold, and took it to the National City Bank in New York. No Citibank. Of course, Walter Rodney, the Guyanese revolutionary, in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Slavery, published in 1972, showed how slavery had impacted Africa's development. The imperialist system bears a major responsibility for African economic retardation by draining African wealth. The capitalists of the Western Europe were the ones who actively extended their exploitation from inside Europe to cover the whole of Africa. And then in more recent times, they were joined by the capitalists from the United States. But Rodney goes on to say that none of these remarks are intended to remove the ultimate responsibility for development from the shoulders of Africans. So it brings us to the legacy of slavery. There are negatives and positives, and this should be familiar to us if we reflect on it. Unfortunately, many descendants of slavery are left with self-hatred or shame, aggression, violence, abuse of others, what we call bad mind, personality disorder that Freddie Hicklin described in Jamaica, disruption of families. But there's also the positive side, the strong pride, self-confidence, resilience, and talawa among descendants of the slaves. Jamaicans insist that people treat them with respect, will fight against injustice, and show social solidarity. And a psychologist in the United States, Dr. Joy DeGruy, actually describes a post-traumatic slave syndrome. We all know about post-traumatic stress syndrome, but she points to this multi-generational trauma exper experienced by African Americans. And it requires profound social changes in individuals as well as in institutions that continue the inequality and injustice towards the descendants of enslaved Africans. And this is what the movement Black Lives Matter is now fighting against. And it has ignited not only in the United States, but also in Europe and across the world. 
but we too must reflect where the remnants of this mentality as well as the institutions that keep people down where it remains also in the former colonies. When we look at the history of epidemics in Jamaica, I already mentioned how bad it was for infant deaths under slavery. Well, following emancipation, it was very, very difficult on the, the poor people, the ex-slaves. By 1850, a massive epidemic of cholera, 40,000 died, turn of the century, yellow fever. By 1910, 80% of the rural population had hookworm. In those days, most people were walking barefoot, and therefore, the parasite got into their feet and hookworm called debilitation and anemia. 1918, the influenza pandemic. The leading cause of death for several decades from 1930 was tuberculosis. Malaria was rife, yours, syphilis. In the 1950s, there were a series of three polio epidemics. And in the 1960s, one out of every three child suffered from malnutrition and gastroenteritis. However, from the 1920s, there was a significant movement to improve health. With the help of the Rockefeller Foundation, there was a basic improvement in sanitation, portable water, provision of latrines, education on basic hygiene, and the building of a cadre of effective public health leadership, the public health inspectors, the public health nurses. By the time after the Second World War, there were four public health campaigns launched island-wide against TB, malaria, yaws, and hookworm. University College of the West Indies Medical Faculty began in 1948. Schools of nursing and networks of health centers were being built. And this brings us to the more modern period. And I started practicing public health in 1976. So I witnessed a lot of this personally. There was a parathion poisoning outbreak, mainly in St. Thomas, contaminated flour. All flour in Jamaica had to be removed for three weeks. The dengue epidemic in 1977, one in every three Jamaicans was estimated to have been infected. Another polio outbreak in 1981. And then in 1980s, the AIDS pandemic and again, we were faced with a challenge, something that people feared, they did not understand, and stigma was terrible. Even among health providers, there were very few health providers willing to look after persons with AIDS. In 1992, typhoid in Westmoreland, when the Roaring River became contaminated, malaria nearly reintroduced into Jamaica in 2004. Again, influenza, we know the modern outbreaks. And now we face the pandemic of COVID. We must ask ourselves, we now have effective treatment for HIV, which is a fantastic development. But are we satisfied that in Jamaica today, every day, there's an estimated new four infections. Four people become newly infected. 1,600 new infections a year. We need to improve prevention and not just deal with treatment. We've had many important public health programs that have had a significant impact on health. The older one among us will remember two is better than too many that brought the total fertility rate down from six children to about just over two. Nutrition was transformed and most of the malnutrition was removed. We now face the problem of obesity. We had oral rehydration therapy for gastroenteritis, transformed dental caries with salt fluoridation. So we've had many solid public health programs. Many people are not aware that the Caribbean has actually led the world 
in eliminating certain infectious diseases. The Caribbean was the first sub-region to eliminate polio in 1982, measles in 1991, congenital rubella syndrome, and rubella. This is before the Americas as a whole, and the Americas as a whole is the only region in the world that has eliminated both measles and rubella. So we have to build on our strengths, and vaccination is one of them, because people appreciate the value of vaccination as the most cost-effective intervention that medicine has. Now, when we look at the causes of disease since 1945, seven of the first 10 causes of death in 1945 were due to infectious diseases. By 2002, only two, namely HIV and respiratory tract infections. So there's been a tremendous transition in relation to public health. And life expectancy has doubled from 38 in 1900 to 74 years now. And in fact, between 1900 and 1921, life expectancy actually went down a year. It was a terrible people, a terrible time for poor people in Jamaica. That's why many people migrated to look for work in Panama. There was a 1907 earthquake, there was hookworm, there was the influenza epidemic, and there was World War I. Infant mortality has also improved significantly from 174 deaths per 1,000 live births in 1900 to approximately 12 today. So what are the current health challenges now outside of COVID and the recurring epidemics? Obesity, hypertension, diabetes, the chronic diseases, along with violence and mental illness. These are the challenges. Now, it's interesting that slavery, the legacy of slavery, is contributing to these chronic diseases. If you think about it, the slaves, for centuries, their body had to adapt to very limited food and sustenance. So the body actually adapts to survive unless now in the modern period, with the improvements in living standards, with fast foods, what it means that people are eating too much and we have obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. Obesity is a disease in itself. And we need to address these more effectively by preventing them and not just trying to treat them. With respect to the legacy of the disruption of the family and the decades of violence, this has contributed to violence in society, abuse of children and women, men killing men, mental illness, depression, and personality disorder. So this is part of the legacy that we face in health. And it's connected to the fact of the social determinants of health that we have to get the social conditions right in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And this is only possible if we get the distribution of the money, the power, and the resources to be more equitable at the global, national, and local levels. Without this, we will be forever combating against disease. So the lessons in rounding off this presentation, most of us need to learn more about our history and heritage. We're all prisoners of our time and our worldview. We're not aware of many of the forces that shape us, so we have to educate ourselves, reflect on life. We have to advocate and fight for our rights and development. We have to take responsibility for our own health, but the emphasis must be on prevention health promotion and primary health care. We want to prevent disease, not just treat it. And it is much better investment to prevent than to depend on treatment. We could get rid of most cancer of the cervix simply by vaccinating 
our girls with HPV vaccine, we could significantly reduce pneumonia by introducing the pneumococcal vaccine among children, and that in turn will protect and prevent elderly getting pneumonia. So we could do much better in vaccination despite how well we have done. 30 years ago, the university showed that a community health aid visiting a vulnerable home once a week can help to educate a mother how to look after her child, how to teach that child to play, not to beat the child, but to stimulate the child. And the research showed that these children do better in school, and 30 years later, those same children are more likely to be employed and not participating in violence. So we need to train more community health aides to help vulnerable homes bring up their children better. Of course, we need to do much better in education, and we need the programs to develop community mental health and primary care. Our leaders have important qualities, that's why they're leaders, but they're not perfect. We must hold them accountable. Power corrupts. Europe grew rich through slavery and colonialism on equal terms of trade. Their policies were enforced by invasion, war, sanctions, threats, loans, propaganda, and subterfuge. Jamaica has experienced all of this. The system of exploitation and oppression remains intact, though it is no more sophisticated. Many people are not even aware of it. Reparations are due. Tons of silver were shipped to Europe to the value of $165 trillion today. Millions of slaves taken from Africa. Belgians lost for ivory and rubber, killed 10 million Congolese. The UK gave compensation to the slave owners of 20 million pounds, worth 200 billion pounds today. The taxpayers in England just finished repaying the loan in 2015. Europe prospered from slavery and the exploitation of its colonies. If we want to prevent disease and promote health, we have to work to have a more equitable distribution of power, money, and resources at the global, national, and local level. We have to transform the social conditions of the people and implement programs to prevent disease and promote health. I thank you for your patience. Brothers and sisters, I'm sure you will all, I'm sure you will agree with me that was well researched comprehensive, clear, and informative. Thank you, Professor Figaro. Well done. I felt as if I was in history class at a point, and when he stopped a while, I got the bell rang, and, I, and, and I'm saying, we could continue, no, sir. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I know we now have a cultural item, from Miss Sharice Martin from the United Theological College of the West Indies. Her piece is entitled Ancestor on the Auction Block by Vera Bell. This will be followed by the prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Um, this will be done by Canon Garth Minot, and we will follow in our program the prayer. Miss Sharice? Ancestor on the Auction Block by Vera Bell. Ancestor on the Auction Block. Across the years, your eyes seek mine, compelling me to look. I see your shackled feet, your primitive black face. I see your humiliation, 
and I turn away ashamed. Across the ears, your eyes seek mine, compelling me to look. Is this creature that I see myself ashamed to look? Because of myself ashamed, shackled by my own ignorance, I stand a slave. Humiliated, I cry to the eternal abyss. For understanding, ancestor on the auction block. Across the years, your eyes seek mine. Electric, I am transformed. My freedom is within myself. I look you in the eyes and see the spirit of God eternal. Of this only need I be ashamed. Of blindness to the God within me. The same God who dwelt inside you. The same eternal God who shall dwell in generations yet unborn. Ancestor on the auction block. Across the years I look. I see you sweating, toiling, suffering. Within your loins, I see the seed of my multitudes. From your labor, grow roads, aqueducts, cultivation. A new country is born. Yours was the task to clear the ground. Mine be the task to build. Thank you. Intercession. A prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we are grateful for your grace manifest in your mercies and fully made known in your Son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful during these times of disruption and dislocation in our lives for the grace you give when burdens grow greater, grief is strong. We are grateful for the strength that you give when troubles increase and are multiplied, yet your grace is multiplied even more. Providing God in the world from which we come, we often forget you. Things visible, tangible and sensual obsess our thoughts, fill our eyes and preoccupy our hearing that we lose sight and audience of you. God, make real to us in this time the things that are real. Let small things seem small and great things great. So rearrange our lives that we put first things first and allow you to rule in our hearts and in our lives. Convert our ways of selfishness so that we may pass through things temporal without losing sight of things eternal. God, give us grateful hearts. Let us, in everything, give thanks through Jesus Christ, our liberator and our brother. 
O God of all the nations of the world, we come with prayers of intercessions to praise and glorify you for your goodness and loving kindness toward us. We praise you for your generosity in giving us from the abundance of your bounty and we glorify you because you are God alone to whom ultimately we are accountable. We intercede for a world in chaos, in transition, where human life and indeed the life of every living thing is at stake. In these days of challenge, dislocation, fear, uncertainty, anxiety, sickness and death, we pray for those on the front line who sacrifice their lives on a daily basis to protect and preserve life. Ever loving God, we pray abundant blessings upon these your servants as they serve humanity. We pray for communities and nations at this time suffering as a result of oppression, crime and violence. May love and care and support overtake and overcome these acts of oppression. Help us to embrace the golden rule of loving our neighbors as ourselves. Ever loving God, give us hearts of compassion and kindness. That coldness and hardness of heart may be replaced with a spirit of generosity and a willingness to sacrifice for the good of others. Hear us, O oh God, answer our prayer and never forsake us. We pray in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. At this time, the offering will be collected. We invite the ushers to come and to collect. I now invite Reverend Raymond Koch from Hope United Church to bless the offering.
Emancipator God, you journey with us in the past and you have brought us to the present. You enable us to celebrate what has been achieved. And you are now giving us strength to face the challenges that are present and those to come. We ask you to accept the offering now presented. May you bless them and use them for that which they have been given. Continue to guide us and use us as change agents for the future. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite Sister Cora Marina Henry from right here at BBC to make the presentation after which we'll have the closing remarks by Sister Madden. Come Cora. Dr. Figueroa, on behalf of the churches of this 27th Emancipation Lecture, please accept this token of our appreciation for your lecture presentation. It was very informative, timely, and enlightening. We have been challenged based on this lecture to resist diseases, promote good health care, especially during this current COVID-19 pandemic. We thank God for allowing us to be exposed to a knowledge of the types of diseases to which our people have been exposed over the years and some of the developments in eliminating certain infectious diseases. And for allowing us to know that we need to make efforts to prevent diseases rather than treating them. Naturally, we must give thanks to those on earth who have allowed us to have the lecture. Firstly, I will thank Professor J. Peter Figaro for accepting the challenge to present today at such short notice. You are certainly a patriot and we thank God for you. We thank God and pray his blessing on the following sponsors of the annual Church's Emancipation Lecture. The National Housing Trust, Carimed Limited, Dennis Grantive, Kingston Bookshop Limited, VTR Engineering Services Limited, Medorest Memorial Gardens, and Gion Contractors and Associates Limited. Thank you all so much. I thank the planning committee for their commitment in planning this lecture. It may well be the first ever to be planned almost entirely using technology. All the meetings, comments, minutes, advice, so much so that our beloved Professor Hopton Dunn, past chairman of the committee, and who is viewing with his wife, Leif, from Botswana, hi Hopton, was able to be instrumental in the planning also. The committee took the chance and here we are today. Thank you, committee members. Thank you to the pastor, administration, ushers, and other members of the Boulevard Baptist Church for allowing the committee to have the lecture here. And what would a church's emancipation lecture be without you? who have come in person or via the internet to watch and listen to today's proceedings. You've been a great audience, and may you always be blessed. We'll now have the benediction by the Reverend Dr. Devon Dick. Please stand for the benediction. The grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. The National Anthem. Alpha, 
God bless our land, guard us with thy mighty hand, keep us free from evil cause, be your light through countless odds. Lead us, great defender, run through wisdom. Justice, truth be ours forever, Jamaica land we love, Jamaica, Jamaica. Just true respect for all, stay response to duty's call. Teach us weak to cherish, give us vision, lest we perish. Knowledge send us, heavenly Father, grant true wisdom from above. Justice, truth be ours forever. Jamaica land we love. Jamaica. I am the truth, Lord of the harmony. I am the light, light of the world to be. Hosanna, I hold your hand, my friend. Hosanna, I give you strength, my friend. Hosanna to walk the seas, my friend. We're gonna sail to victory. Sailing. Sailing, sailing across the river, sailing, sailing, sailing across the river, freedom, 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 freedom in the life of Jesus, Hosanna, I hold your hand, my friend, Hosanna, I give you strength, my friend, Hosanna, to walk the seas, my friend, we're gonna sail to victory, I am the vine. You shall abide in me, I am the river, you shall be cleansed in me, I am the rock, you shall have life in me, Hosanna, I hold your hand, my friend, Hosanna, I give you strength, my friend, Hosanna, to walk the seas, my friend, we're gonna sail to victory, sailing, Sailing, sailing across the river, sailing, 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 sailing across the river, sailing, freedom, freedom, freedom in the life of Jesus. Hosanna, I hold your hand, my friend. Hosanna, I give you strength, my friend. Hosanna, to walk the seas, my friend. We're gonna sail to victory. I am your God, rising in victory. I am your brother, living in flesh with thee. I am your Savior, dying on Calvary. Hosanna, I hold your hand, my friend. Hosanna, I give you strength, my friend. Hosanna, to walk the seas, my friend. We're gonna sail to victory, sailing. Sailing, sailing across the river, sailing, 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 sailing across the river, sailing, freedom, 
Freedom, freedom in the life of Jesus Hosanna, I hold your hand, my friend Hosanna, I give you strength, my friend Hosanna, to walk the seas, my friend We're gonna sail to victory Sailing, sailing, sailing across the river Sailing, sailing, sailing Sailing across the river, sailing Freedom, freedom Freedom in the life of Jesus Hosanna, I hold your hand, my friend Hosanna, I give you strength, my friend Hosanna, to walk the seas, my friend We're gonna sail to victory Amen What a wonderful evening we have had All right, looking on our programs We're gonna be having the sharing of the tamarind balls The ushers will give us those goodies. I'm just going to read the significance as we go. What is the significance of the tamarind balls? The tamarind ball suits the celebration as it reminds us of the sour and sweet of the emancipation experience. The sour taste of oppression, but the sweet knowledge of the power of our ancestors and ourselves to triumph over oppression and adversity. The tamarind, also known by its biological name, Tamarindus indica, is classified in the family of legumes. The tamarind tree is a tropical evergreen tree raised for its edible fruit. This tall evergreen is native to southern Asia and the tropics of both hemispheres. As we exit, you will take your tamarind ball. Have a blessed evening and a wonderful week. God bless you all.